Hey church family, thanks for joining me tonight for our Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time. Uh, we're really glad you're here. Hope uh, that you're having a good week. Hope you had a nice Valentine's Day yesterday. And uh, if you have people in your life uh, who love you and who you love, I hope you're able to spend some time with them. Uh, or at the least, uh, give thanks to God for them and express your appreciation and your love to them. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, I really don't have anybody in my life. Uh, I hope it was an opportunity for you to consider um, to give thanks for those people uh, who have been in your life um, and uh, who have loved you. And I hope you also stop and remember, if you know the Lord, uh, you are loved and valued more than you can ever imagine. And uh, what a great truth that is. And so I hope that'll be an encouragement to you and uh, that we'll go forth in God's love. Speaking of, that's the subject we're going to begin to study here for the next few weeks, the subject of love. A lot has been written about love. Uh, over 100 million songs have been recorded and written about the subject of love. Think about that. 100 million uh, people who are writing and singing about their experiences with love, their disappointments with love, and their emotions and ideals about love and expectations of love. And I would dare say that the writing and the recording uh, hasn't stopped. It will continue on. 154 sonnets or love poems were written by one man himself, William Shakespeare. Uh, love's a popular subject. Uh, at the heart of it all, we all want to be loved. Having said that, people sadly don't really understand what uh, true love, um, uh, love that is pictured and it's demonstrated by God's love for man. People don't understand what that true love is really all about. And uh, we want to hope to uh, provide some clarity. Even as Christians, we have false concepts and unreal expectations and um, skewed definitions of love. And so we really want to take time and look in the scriptures and, and, and study this subject. Before we do that, just a reminder, check your email. Make sure you download the prayer uh, letter. Uh, we've got a few families who've suffered loss. Mark and Vanessa Ortiz. Uh, Mark lost his mom last week. So pray for the him and the family. Uh, also, uh, George Gress. George is a, is a part of our church in the Bronx. And his mom passed away last week as well. Pray for Joanne Samidi, who lost her brother uh, a little over a week ago. Uh, and so many others. We just need to continue to pray. Pray for uh, the dear folks in Turkey and Syria as they continue to, to try to move forward um, after the devastation of the earthquake. And, uh, just pray the gospel will go forth and i know that there are groups there and uh, that are uh, going to do all they can to share verbally but even uh, through action pray that um, people will have open hearts and open minds to the gospel in this time so uh, join me as we pray tonight and then pray for the aldermans our missionaries the aldermans been in many 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 years in togo uh, west africa uh, jj grew up there and got married and went back there and uh, done a great work for 15 or 16 years uh, assembled a team of about 10 uh, partners and missionaries there in Togo, church planting, and uh, really doing an amazing job. Assembled a, a second team in the country of Benin, which is adjacent to Togo, church planting there. And uh, early last year, um, his wife went to the doctor and was diagnosed with a very severe case of MS, and it was determined that it was best for her uh, to come to the States. And so uh, unexpectedly, uh, certainly not part of their plans, but they felt like that's what God would have them to do. So they have moved back. Their work continues. But be praying for them in this transition time. JJ accepted a position while his wife and, and girls will be able to be at, at States. He'll be traveling around the world, back and forth to Togo and Benin, but all over the world, really, to help missionaries to uh, duplicate, really, some of the things God allowed him to do. Uh, in, in Togo for many years and so just pray for them in this time it's it's a transition time we all understand that so uh, I know that they really appreciate your prayers uh, if you have your Bibles tonight we're gonna look at two passages John chapter 15 and then we're gonna go to 1st Corinthians chapter 13 as we think about this subject of love uh, love you know we all have our ideas and uh, what we think it's it is or supposed to be uh, when you come into the New Testament you find that uh, a new expression of love is now um, uh, introduced. 
you know, there were several Greek words that described love. One was uh, eros, or the, where we get the English word erotic, which is sensual and moral. And uh, then there was another word for love, that was phileo, which was a brotherly love, a love you'd have for a sibling or a family member or a close friend. Um, but when Jesus came along, he introduced a, a new expression of love. It's a word that we uh, describe as uh, agape love. And it's really a decision to love. It's a deep love that is uh, committed uh, despite what the response to that love may be. And again, you know, we find that Jesus uh, not only declares this love, but expresses this love and demonstrates this love. The Bible says in John 3.16, John, who understood the love of Christ, uh, he was known as the beloved disciple. He was the cousin of Jesus and writes more about love than any of the disciples. He would say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So Jesus, agape, he um, gives this love. He's committed to this love. And why? Because he is love. Uh, the first John chapter 4 verse 16 tells us that God is love. He doesn't just possess love. He hasn't uh, figured out how to love. He uh, doesn't consistently work at loving. His very being in essence is love. And it's quite an amazing thought to know that God can be sovereign and God can be omnipotent and God can be omniscient and immutable and changing. And he can also be love. Um, and He's not less or more. He is uh, equal uh, in, in all of those things. And, and, and what a great uh, uh, truth about God. And so it starts with God, originates with God, and he demonstrates this love toward us that even when we were unlovely, Romans 5, 8, even when we were sinners, he loved us and he died for us. And we are told now to love him because he first loved us. Those of us who know Christ as our Savior, now we are told to go and to carry on in the same love. So uh, love is more than just a noun. It's a verb. We're to choose to love people. We're to choose to, to, to show God's love through our lives towards others despite the response. And uh, that's God's desire for us. That reveals that we are his disciples. Notice in John uh, chapter 15, and you see that very clearly here, verse number eight, Jesus would say, herein is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. Okay, he wants us to produce in our life. So shall you be my disciples. So as the father loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. So to be a disciple of Christ and to produce and to, to be what Christ wants us to be as his follower, we can't do that if we do not love like he loves. And we know Jesus and the Father are one. But if, and if you understand the Trinity, you realize that. But uh, for uh, illustration's sake, Jesus says, look, the Father loved me and then I love you. And now you are to continue in that love toward other people. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, then you shall abide in my love. And as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. These things uh, have I spoken unto you, so that your joy can remain full, and your joy might be full. Uh, you want to be my disciple. You want to bring forth much fruit. You want to honor and glorify the Father. You want to experience joy and that joy to be full in your life. Then uh, you need to love as I love. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. If you're not sure to what scale and to what degree, verse 13, greater love no man than this, but that a man lay down his life for his friends. So you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant doesn't know what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I've heard my Father, I've made known unto you. You've not chosen me, I've chosen you, and I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So these things I command you, that you love one another. I've got big plans for you. Um, uh, I, I want to bless you. I want to uh, spiritually prosper you. I want you to change the world. I want you to bring forth much fruit. Um, and uh, what I need you to do is follow me. And what I need you to do is emulate my example and love 
as I have loved you. And that's so important. First Corinthians chapter 13, when you think about love, you can't help but think about uh, this chapter. It's often described as the love chapter. And so just tonight, I want to leave you with a, a thought uh, in your life and in mine when it comes to to this subject of love. Remember Galatians 5 and verse 22, the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is what? It, love, first one. First thing that the Spirit of God begins to do and begins to change and begins to develop in us when we become new creatures in Christ is He begins to, to help us to love other people as He has loved us. And it's not always easy, and it's a constant grind, and, and it's a day-in, day-out battle, but it's imperative uh, that we continue to work at it. Paul would write, now remember, he writes to this church, they had a lot of issues. I mean, they were a very carnal, wicked church. Uh, sin was in the church. So Paul, at times, is very forceful, uh, very blunt, uh, very corrective. And uh, he tells them things they need to change and things they need to stop doing and things they need to begin doing. And he gets to the end of chapter 12 and he says, look, I'm, I'm telling you so many things and giving you so many options. But verse 31, I am now going to show you a more excellent way. Uh, it shows you the value. It shows you the priority of love. And uh, we need not to miss that. Love is vitally important. It's important to God. It's important to his cause. It's important to our growth and our spiritual maturity and our effectiveness as disciples of Jesus Christ. And going back to what I said earlier, we all want to be recipients of love. Uh, and every person we meet has that same desire. And to know that there is a God who loves them, um, we, they just need to know that. And how will they know if we don't express that truth to them out of hearts full of love? Notice that Paul really writes to the priority of love. Uh, sometimes we think there are more important things in life. Um, you know, talent and skill and ambition and drive and, um, you know, resources. And, and those all have important place. But often we minimize uh, the importance of love. Now, again, you know, uh, there's a place for all of those things. Remember, Jesus would always speak the truth, but he would do so in love. Uh, he is love. He couldn't separate himself from that. So Paul wants this church to understand that uh, them possessing love and pursuing the love of God uh, and practicing the love of God in their life is going to make a tremendous difference uh, in their life. Notice, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not charity, then I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Uh, you may be the wisest, most intelligent, skilled linguist. You might speak multiple languages. Uh, cosmopolitan city was Corinth. You might have high education. Um, uh, and you might be able to talk circles around me. Um, you could even potentially speak the language of angels. But if you possessed all those things, practiced all of those things, but you did so without love in your heart, it's all uh, an offensive, odious noise. It's just like clamoring and clanking. I'm thankful for the musicians that God has given to us in our church. Um, and I play the piano a little bit, but I certainly have no skill set to play any other instruments. Uh, I wish I knew how to play a guitar. I wish I could play a drum. I certainly don't know how to play any kind of woodwinds or brass or horns. Uh, a few times in my life, I've picked up a horn and I've tried to blow in it. And my cheeks get really big and nothing comes out. Or the sound you hear is very foul and uh, shrill. And Bible says... Our efforts, our wisdom, our skills without love um, become very offensive, not only to God, but even to the people we're trying to minister to. We could come off as proud and arrogant, and we uh, miss opportunities. And notice verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy, wow, 
I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Uh, remember, at this point in time, the canon or the um, completeness of the word of God was not yet completed. God was still giving new revelation. He doesn't give new revelation now to people. You don't just sit on a mountain and get some new vision. Um, he closed his his message, his word. Uh, John um, reveals that in Revelation 22. You don't need to add and you don't need to take away. And here it is. But at this point in time, um, Paul said there are still uh, times when God is giving new revelation and, and God is still teaching us things and we're recording it. And so maybe you have that gift and you can declare something new and a message from God and you have the ability to explain it in a way which is just amazing and eye-opening to people. But you do that without a heart full of love, you're at a disadvantage. You're, you're ineffective. He would go on, or if you had all faith so that you could remove mountains. Wow. Faith to move mountains. Remember Jesus had taught if you had the faith as of the grain of a mustard seed. Years ago, I passed out mustard seeds in church one Sunday. I had to tape them to a piece of paper. They were so small. Jesus would say, if you had faith this big, you could say to a mountain, move into the ocean, and the mountain would move. And uh, what I realized is, wow, I have very little faith. Um, I would never probably need to tell a mountain to move, but the idea was if you have just that much faith, you could trust God to do amazing things in life. And Paul would say, if you had that kind of faith and you could make mountains move, but you had not charity, you're really nothing. That's how valuable uh, true love is and, and possessing it, but practicing it and, and revealing it in the lives of other people. That's how important it is, not only for you and your benefit and, and, the, and for the cause of Christ, but it's that important to God. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, that's admirable. But if I do these good things without a heart full of love, it's empty. Though I give my body to be burned, I sacrifice because uh, uh, I want to be known as someone who's sacrificial. That's great. But if I do it with the wrong motive and I don't have a heart full of love, then it profits me nothing. Uh, you remember the Pharisees, they would give alms, they would pray big prayers, but they did not do so out of a heart of love. And so we understand the importance and the priority uh, that love is to have. And so may I just say as we close tonight that you and I would think about God's love for us. Think about the, the depths of the riches of his love. Think about uh, what his love uh, has done in our life, how it's changed our lives and our eternity. Um, and then begin to ask yourself, do I possess that type of love? Uh, for other people? Am I pursuing other people? Have I made the commitment in my life that I'm going to seek to love people like Christ loves me? And do uh, I value that love in my life? And if we will begin to pursue that, then as we go through our study and we begin to learn um, the objects of love and, and, and the results of love, then, then it begins to, to be something that we can put into practice and we can truly be the representatives, uh, the ambassadors of Christ that he wants us to be. Uh, uh, the Father loved me. I loved you. Now I'm telling you to go forth and continue in my love. Continue to live it. Continue to show it. Continue to reveal it. Not disingenuously. Make sure it's that agape love. A love that has made a decision to love regardless of the result or the outcome. And if we'll do that, we'll be more like Christ. So may God help us uh, to love like he does. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for our time. Help us to truly love. It, it doesn't come natural, Lord, for everyone. Uh, there are some people we love naturally, but uh, to love the world, to love our enemies, to love our brothers and sisters, to love the lost, Lord, that didn't always come naturally. But we know it's a spiritual fruit, and we know that you, Spirit of God, are going to work in our lives. Let us be open to that, and let us understand the importance of love uh, like you love us. And so, Lord, I pray you bless our time of prayer. Use us this week for your glory and honor, we pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, God, we'll see you this Sunday. Have a great night.